You may be seated. Well, welcome to Grace Bible Church. Um, if you're visiting, we would just love to invite you back on Sunday morning at 1015. There we get to hear as uh, one of our pastors walks us through the book of Revelation. Sunday nights, we do something differently, and we love Sunday nights. It's a little bit smaller. Uh, we get to hear from a variety of our pastor elders, as well as some seminary students, and it's just it's just a, a sweet environment as we've been making our way through uh, the book of Psalms. And so that's where we'll be tonight. We'll be in Psalm 16. Um, before we get there, I, maybe if I could just open up by way of introduction and, and talk about growing up. Uh, when I was growing up, we lived a couple hours away from both sets of our grandparents, and so we didn't get to see them all that often. But whenever they came to visit... There is this immense anticipation. I remember I would go and I would sit by the window waiting till I see the headlights come up the driveway and then I would immediately run and tell everybody, they're here, they're here. One of the things is when my grandmother came, she had a bit of a sweet tooth and she would bring every time peanut brittle and chocolate covered raisins. Now I wouldn't eat a raisin under any other circumstances, but if you put chocolate on it, it's a different story. But there was just this anticipation with her arrival that brought joy, something worth waiting for. Well, fast forward. When my own daughters were growing up, uh, they had a similar anticipation to the arrival of their grandparents, who were a little further away, and we saw them a little less often. But what stands out most to me about those visits from grandparents in, in my daughter's lives is their tears and their wails upon the grandparents' departure. Melissa and I would strategize how to make it easy and as quick as possible because we knew we needed to be there to help mop up the tears when they left. Relationships with those we love can be like that. Joy when present and sorrow when absent. And Jesus knew the sadness that his departure was going to bring to his disciples. Turn your Bibles briefly to John 16. As his crucifixion approached, Jesus told his disciples that in a little while they would no longer see him. And then later they would see him again. This really confused the disciples who were still holding on to the idea that Jesus was about to take up his earthly reign right then. And so in John 16, 18, they said, we don't know what he's talking about. We see him now, then we won't, and then we'll see him again. Is this a riddle? Jesus responds with more detail. And look at verse 20 at what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will cry and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful but your sorrow will be turned into joy. The disciples had left everything to follow Jesus, but they didn't yet understand that he needed to suffer for sins before he would return to take up his reign. And when the reality of Jesus' death would finally sink in, they would experience immense sorrow. Sorrow at the loss of a friend, sorrow at the seeming loss of everything they hoped for, sorrow maybe over what they gave up and walked away from. Sorrow that the world turned against Jesus, the world may be turning against them, that evil seems to prevail. And Jesus knew their sorrow that would come, but he told them, your sorrow will be turned into joy. They might have asked Jesus when. Look at verse 22. Therefore, you too have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice. Jesus will leave, but they'll see him again, and then they will rejoice. And we know what the disciples didn't yet understand, that Jesus was speaking of his death and resurrection. But when they saw the resurrected Jesus, their sorrow would yield way to joy. But what if he went away again? And he would. Would their joy again turn to sorrow when he departed for heaven? Was their joy solely dependent upon his continued physical presence with them? 
Look at verse 22 again. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. Jesus knew that he would depart again, and yet he promised them a joy that would never be taken away. Eleven verses later, he even promised tribulation would come, and yet they would have what they needed to hold on to joy. It would be a lasting joy that could survive even his departure. And as we see the rest of the New Testament unfold, this is exactly what we see in the lives of the disciples. Do you remember Acts 13, in the face of being driven out of the city to escape persecution, we see the disciples, in the words of Luke, continually filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. Or what about Acts 16, when we see Paul and Silas praying? There we go. Cut out for a second. Praying hymns of God, hymns to God while in prison. They were able to hold on to joy after Jesus' departure that transcended those circumstances, that survived persecution, imprisonment, slander, and beatings. And so tonight, as we continue our journey through the first 50 Psalms, in the songbook of Israel, we'll look at Psalm 16. So go ahead and turn to Psalm 16. And we'll see that even in the Old Testament, even before the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell believers, God's people could find joy in a fallen world. And I trust that Psalm 16 will be instructive to us and encouraging for us as we find ourselves embroiled in a battle in a fallen world to actually fight for joy, to fight for lasting joy in a world that threatens to rob us of that joy. So let's read Psalm 16 together. And as we do, just pay attention to David's expressions of joy, rejoicing, delight, pleasure throughout that psalm. A miktam of David, possibly an inscription, we're not certain. Verse 1, keep me, O God, for I take refuge in you. O oh, my soul, you have said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good without you. And as for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The pains of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. And I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor I will, will I take their names upon my lips. Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my inheritance is beautiful to me. I will bless Yahweh who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices my flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not forsake my soul to shield. You will not give your Holy One over to see corruption. You will make known to me the paths of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. We can see where David is going at the end of this psalm, gladness, rejoicing, eternal life, standing in God's presence, where we will have joy in its fullest measure with eternal pleasures. It's where he's going. But throughout the psalm, we have a window into how we can actually make progress in cultivating lasting joy in this life. In Psalm 16, David lays out for us eight essential strongholds of lasting joy in a fallen world. Eight essential strongholds of lasting joy in a fallen world. The first one we'll look at this evening is take refuge in God as the source of joy. Verse 1, David starts out, keep me, O God, for I take refuge in you. David cries out, God, protect me, keep me. I have no other protection in my life unless you grant it. And in Psalm 16, we don't know the circumstances. 
But I'd suggest the greatest clarity we might have on this psalm is that David is writing in reflection upon the Davidic covenant found in 2 Samuel 7. And we'll get into maybe a little bit of the reason for that a little bit later. And we won't spend time looking at 2 Samuel 7, but it's helpful to remember the covenant promised to David. That after he died, one of his descendants after him would be a ruler over Israel in an everlasting kingdom in a land where his people Israel would never again be disturbed by the unrighteous. And that means that in writing Psalm 16, based on God's covenant with him, David is fully aware that he will, in fact, one day die. If Christ returns in our lifetime, we who are in Christ will escape death. Not David. David knew he would die. So when David prays, keep me, O God, I don't don't believe we should understand this as David asking to be preserved from death, although he certainly prays that at other times. Here he knows he will enter the realm of death one day, maybe soon, and he says, protect me, keep me, my refuge is in you. God as his refuge doesn't make him immune to death. No, rather, it is an expression of his trust and his dependence upon the Lord. Nothing can happen to him that God does not allow. Notice David doesn't say, from now on, I will take refuge in you. No, this is what David was already accustomed to doing. During all of life's trials, God had always been and always would be David's refuge, his place of safety. And in this world, this fallen world is full of dangers, dangers that would threaten to dishearten us, discourage us, cause us to fear, cause us to despair and curse God. That would rob us of joy in this life. And as David shows us the strongholds of lasting joy, the first thing that we must see is that God must be our refuge. Where do you turn in times of trouble? Do you trust in yourself and man's devices to turn anywhere but the good and safe hands of the Lord will not lead to joy, but lead to destruction? To turn to yourself would be as what Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. When we trust in our own wisdom rather than the Lord's, the result will be fear and anxiety because we'll know that the situation is actually out of our control. We're in over our head and Instead, we actually must turn to the one who orchestrates all things and holds everything in his hands, who has good purposes for us in all of our circumstances. And we take comfort in that and we seek refuge in that, not in our abilities and our wisdom. And that's where we can actually find joy and gladness in entrusting ourselves to God's wisdom. Well, the second stronghold I'd like to look at this evening is Acknowledge God's goodness as the foundation of joy. Verse 2 reads, O my soul, you have said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good without you. And many of the verses in Psalm 16 are sort of difficult to translate. And the additional words added in italics, O my soul, sort of help us to make, make sense of this expression which is best understood as a meaning, maybe equivalent to I have said, my soul has said, I have said. And so so here is David reflecting back upon an earlier confession of his to Yahweh. He says, I have said, you are my Lord. I have no good without you. Here we see in a broken world, David needing to remind himself of what he already knew to be true It's as if David says to himself, hey, remember when you professed your loyalty to Yahweh? When you entrusted yourself to his lordship? Remember when you recognized that every good thing that you have in this life, every joy, every gladness came from him? David, self, this doesn't maybe feel true right now, but you knew it to be true then, remember it to be true today. The God who protects you, keeps you, And it's the foundation and source of every joy in this life. Trust him, follow him. 
Chris, I just appreciated the, the way he led us today to think about sometimes singing things that our heart doesn't feel because we need to instruct ourselves. We need to speak to ourselves. Stop listening to ourselves. And this is what David is doing. David is speaking truth to himself. He's saying, David, submit yourself to what you know to be true of God. What, is, what you know to be true of God has not changed, even if your circumstances have Recognize in your tribulation that would rob you of joy that God is the source of everything good in this life and to know him is our greatest good. Well, the third essential stronghold of lasting joy in a fallen world is number three, embrace God's people as God's gift of joy. Verse three reads, as for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Notice David's delight in God's people. He found joy in the people of God. When difficulty and trial comes into your life, you might be tempted to isolate yourself from others. Maybe you're like me and you just want to go be alone, turn the mind off, sit yourself in front of a TV, binge watch your favorite streaming service, watch YouTube videos, scroll Instagram. Why? Why do we do this? To serve ourselves. I'm not getting what I want in life right now, and I'd rather not deal with that at the heart level. I'm going to go spend time alone doing what I want to do. But ask yourself, does that actually bring you joy? When you spend your time feeding your fleshly desires, does it satisfy? No, it actually usually leaves us with regret, and yet it leaves us wanting more of it because we're still chasing that satisfaction that just won't yield itself. But notice David, in this sin sinful world, didn't isolate, but rather drew near to God's people. He delighted in them. This is like Peter. When he exhorted the suffering believers in 1 Peter 5, 9, saying, resist him, that is, resist the devil, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished among your brethren who are in the world. You're not alone in this. There is a comfort in this life that God gives us, his people, so that we don't endure these difficulties and trials alone. He's given us fellow believers, those who David calls the saints who are in the earth. His delight isn't in the angels, but in believers in the earth, believers with faults and shortcomings and sin. Fellow believers can help us fight for joy through their encouragement, through their example, through their reminder that we're not alone, through the reminder that my life is to be spent on behalf of others and in service of others, and that helps me take my mind off of myself. And when we forget that, and we seek to live for ourselves, we won't find joy. So let me ask you, do you, do you lack joy because you withhold yourselves from loving others in the church? We need to embrace God's people as a gift from God for our joy. And we must have a joy that is rooted in love for the Lord and love for his people. And this just is exactly what John is getting at in 1 John 3, 14. He says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and the one who does not love abides in death. Verse 16 says, by this we have known love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. In a broken world, when you're sinned against, when everything seems against you, embrace God's gift of the people of God in your life. And those relationships are going to have sin. Pursue peace wherever they're broken. Forgive and seek forgiveness. Don't isolate yourself. We already read from Proverbs it said, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Who will speak truth to us if we isolate? Invest in your relationships with fellow believers because God intends for them to be a means in him 
of joy in a broken world. Next, we need to recognize the, the peril, the danger of counterfeit joy. Verse 4 reads, The pains of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. David here reflects on the devastating reality of seeking our joy in lesser things. Right? He's picturing those around him who have bartered for, paid money for, hastened to, or chased after other gods. Drink offerings weren't made with blood in the Old Testament, so it's clear what is pictured here is idol worship. And in David's time, the gods of the nations held out the promise of enticing rewards and benefits that appealed to the flesh. Maybe it was a promise of peace and safety in another nation. Maybe it was material prosperity or the respect and acceptance of those around us or better crops or sexual favor For a variety of reasons, people gave their allegiance to false gods because of what it promised. Well, we have idols in our day as well. We give our hearts and our attention to a myriad of other things that compete for allegiance in our hearts. Often, often we do it because of the fleeting pleasures that they promise. We pursue our idols to find satisfaction and happiness and joy in something other than which God intended. And what does David say is the result of pursuing satisfaction, pursuing vain worship, the allegiance to idols, more joy, no, more pain, multiplied pain, If we chase after seeking pleasure and joy in this world, we will only compound our sorrows. Don't covet this world. Don't buy its its lies. Don't buy its charms, its deceptions. God intends for our joy to be found in him. And when we do that, we can actually find joy in his gifts, rightly acknowledged as coming from his hand. So David recognized the peril of counterfeit joy around him, and he expressed his refusal to have any part of it. I won't participate in the false gods' worship. I won't even let their names come out of my mouth. You remember the last words of John's first epistle? Little children, guard yourself from idols. So we must do the same. We must recognize the perils of counterfeit joy as we pursue lasting joy in him. Number five, we must rejoice in God's provision of himself for your joy. We see in verses five and six, David is overcome with gratefulness at the goodness of God and his provision for him. As he's been reflecting on the Davidic covenant, could, there could be a lot of things that might bring David joy. The, maybe the continued promise of land for the people. Maybe it's his own name, which God had promised he would make great. Maybe it's joy in the fact that somebody from his family is going to have an everlasting kingdom. Maybe it's the fact that Israel is finally going to have peace from all of its enemies. But what is David most overcome by here? Look at verse 5. Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. The same sentiment is picked up by Asaph in Psalm 73. You don't have to turn there. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. David says Yahweh is the portion of his inheritance. So what did he mean by that? Well, think back to Numbers 18. There is the establishment of the Levitical priesthood. And Yahweh said to Aaron and his family, you shall have no inheritance in the land, nor any portion among them. 
I am your portion and your inheritance among the, the sons of Israel. Every tribe was to have an inheritance or portion of land when they entered the promised land, but not Levi. Their portion was their unique, unique relationship with the Lord, their privilege of temple service before the Lord and getting to represent the people of God before him. And while the house of David, or specifically the tribe of Judah, certainly will have an inheritance, an allotment of land in Israel, what occupies David's focus is not an allotment of land, but that he has God himself. What does David inherit? Yahweh himself. The produce of the land constituted one's livelihood. It represented one's standing in society, what one would leave to their children. But Yahweh made the world. To, to gain him, to gain the one who made and controls everything, the inventor of every pleasure, that was better than all earthly joys. Well, notice the contrast between David's portion Yahweh, and the portion of the wicked. Just look to the next psalm, Psalm 17. Psalm 17, verse 13. We read, second half of verse 13, Protect my soul from the wicked with your sword, from men with your hand, O Yahweh, from men of the world, whose portion is in this life. David's portion was not in what he could gain in this life, not in what the world could offer, but God himself. Christian, the greatest news is that in the gospel, we get God himself. That's our singular aim, our greatest privilege. And if we're in Christ, God has given us the gift of himself. No matter what trial comes our way, we tether ourselves to the privilege that we know our God and Savior. We'll continue on in verse 5. We're back in Psalm 16. David continues, Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my inheritance is beautiful to me. There's an interpretive question as to whether David is now turning his discussion to the actual allotment of land in the second half of verse 5, if so, he might be recognizing as secondary to the joy of having God himself that he also has an actual inheritance in the land of Israel, which is reiterated in the Davidic covenant. So that, that might be what's going on. He might also be just continuing the imagery of this land allotment, this portion from verse 5 through verse 6 to describe God as in his inheritance. And if that's the case, when he says, my inheritance is beautiful to me, what he's actually describing is God himself. But whatever the case, in between these two realities of his inheritance is, are his reflections about the meticulous care and sovereignty of God over every detail of his life. And, and it's pictured, God's meticulous care is pictured as extending even down to the casting of a lot. A seemingly random event. God orchestrated even the smallest events of David's life to work together for David's good. To cause the lines to fall to him in pleasant places. To do him good. And this is the idea of Romans 8, 28 that we know and we read and we love. And we know that God causes all things for those, for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purposes. God causes all things to work together for good. This is the same truth. Similar in verse 6, we see this discussion of lines that are falling, uh, refers to physical hope, physical rope, uh, maybe that would be used in establishing an inheritance. God cares about all of the details of my life. There's no single road molecule, no roll of the dice, no casting of the lot. Everything in your life has the divine signature on it. Nothing in your current situation caught God by surprise. 
And in fact, he is using it to accomplish his good purposes towards you. And that's a cause for joy. Our joy is an outflow of our overwhelming confidence in the character of who God is, his trustworthiness, the good that he shows to his children. When we're confident in his character, we can joyfully submit to his decisions and his purposes. Well, next, as we move to verse 7, we look at the sixth stronghold of lasting joy in a fallen world that is cling to God's wisdom as a ballast of joy. David continues in verse 7, I will bless Yahweh who has counseled me. How has Yahweh counseled David? We're not given a lot of window into here, but perhaps we can hear David in his own words speak of God's counseling activity in his life. Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8, I'll just read it. He says, the law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing in the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. In that section of Psalm 19, David is speaking of God's word. And what is the effect of God's word in just those two verses? It restores the soul. It enlightens the eyes. It makes wise the simple. And it rejoices the heart. God's word gives wisdom. God's word gives counsel. It produces joy. And in the life of David, he would have been tasked with being in the Torah, being in the law and copying it and meditating on it, making a copy for himself. And David says, Yahweh has counseled me. I will bless Yahweh for that. And this is a cause for David for praising God. Do you want joy in this life? Submit your life under the wisdom of God and his word. In David's life, his submission under the counsel of Yahweh and his word actually resulted in him praising and blessing God. When we praise and bless God out of the overflow of our heart, that's joyful. It should be. Don't trust in your own counsel, but seek his counsel. Proverbs 3, 5, familiar verse, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. We don't need to lean on our, under, our understandings. We want to lean on his understanding and he has given that to us in his word. So David blesses Yahweh who has counseled him through his word. So we are to cling to God's wisdom as a ballast of joy and a, a ballast is something heavy perhaps rocks that would be placed in the bottom of a ship to grant stability or control. In a similar way, God's word, when sought, when believed and submitted to, becomes that which provides the stability for our lasting joy. Without its ballast, an overloaded ship might capsize when the waves come. We need God's word, God's wisdom, and God's counsel to stabilize us Amidst the lies of a broken world. So David is continues in verse 7. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. The mind, or literally the kidneys, is not just the brain, but it speaks to the inner man, the, the seed of faith and the will and the conscience. David's not describing here some mystical leading of God, but the ongoing effects of submitting his mind and heart to God's wisdom. This is far more than just knowledge of God's word, but it is an actual treasuring and valuing and prizing of God's word with the intent to submit and obey to it. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. And we often look at that verse as, oh, that's the verse that tells me I need to memorize scripture. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good implication. But notice the word there is that I have treasured in my heart. I don't just know it. 
but I treasure it, I value it, I submit my life under it, I run to it with an intent to obey it. This is a prizing of God's word with a moral intentionality. So what's pictured is not just memorization, but meditation. This work of faith when we submit to God's word is true and trustworthy. God's counsel that David speaks of, and embraced with an intention to submit and obey to it, in David, had a result. It resulted in in an informed conscience that remained active long after his Bible or his scrolls were put away. God's word on his heart, treasured in his heart, was instructing him when God's word is open and continuing to instruct him when it was closed. It's in this reason, for this reason that he can say in verse 8, I have set Yahweh continually before me. As David continually returns his thoughts to God's word, he's also constantly cultivating an awareness that God is present. David lived his life in the presence of God. He couldn't see him. But he knew God was there and saw his actions as well as his own heart. An awareness of God's presence should have a purifying effect. You, you mean he can see even the motives of my own heart and everything I think? Yes. And he still cares for us. For the believer, this isn't a cause for fear. God's nearness is our comfort. Look at the rest of verse 8. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. David didn't cower at the reality that God was actually present and could see what was going on in his heart. That was actually a source of comfort to him. I don't need to fear the evil around me, Satan's devices, or even the effects of a fallen world as my body begins to fall apart because God is near. He's at my side. I don't need to be shaken. My joy doesn't need to be shaken. It's not in this world. It's not in my circumstances. And again, this this same sentiment was on the lips of Asaph in Psalm 73. We we read from Psalm 73 once. Here it is again, verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have set Lord Yahweh as my refuge. We can just hear the echoes of Psalm 16 on Asaph's lips when he writes Psalm 73. So draw near to him in his word. Cling to his wisdom as a ballast for your joy in this fallen world. Moving to verse 9, it'll be helpful just to consider briefly what the author of Hebrews said about death. Hebrews 2.15 says that mankind, through the fear of death, are subject to slavery all their lives. So as such... As we're talking about things that might rob our joy, there might be nothing else with as much deadly potential to rob us of joy as a fear of death. So this leads us to consider our seventh essential stronghold of lasting joy. Number seven, be convinced of the powerlessness of death. Verse nine reads, therefore, My heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. As a consequence of being saturated in God's word and submitting his will under his word with the heart to obey and living in an ever-present awareness of God's presence, David says, therefore, as as a consequence of that, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. David is likely referring to his glory here as a reference to the whole of his inner man uh, in seeking to convey this inner joy, uh, or the inner man, I should say. The translators of the Greek Old Testament said David's heart was glad and his tongue rejoiced. Kind of reflecting the outward expression of that inner man. Uh, This translation is also reflected in Peter's quotation of Psalm 16 in Acts 2. So verse 9 contains then the joyful response to a life lived under the goodness of God's wisdom found in his word. But there is a secondary effect of living under God's word this way. 
And that is you will believe what it says. David says, my flesh also will dwell securely. And again, that the way this gets translated in the Greek Old Testament and then again from there in the New Testament is maybe a little bit different than what we see in our English Bibles. The translation of the Greek Old Testament says, my flesh will live or dwell in hope. So from dwell securely or dwell in hope. And this really isn't a challenge because like the, the root of this word, which usually carries the idea of safety and security, does occur elsewhere in the Old Testament, carrying the ideas of confidence, of trust, and hope. So when the Greek Old Testament and the New Testament use the word hope, that may actually just be capturing this maybe rare nuance of the the word that David is using here. So the idea is not absolute safety, as if David cannot be harmed or killed, for he knew with certainty that he was going to die. We covered that. Rather, because of what he knows in God's word to be true, because of his trustworthiness, because of his character and his intention for good, he can live in hope and trust that whatever happens is good and right, even death. How do we know that, de- that David has death in view? Well, look at verse, 12, verse 10. David says, For you will not forsake my soul to Sheol, Well, before we dive into that, two words bear mention here. First is soul. We often think of soul the way we use it as the the inner man compared to the outer man, right? When, when, When we die, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Our body is in the ground. Our soul is in heaven. That doesn't always carry true as to the way that word is used in the Old Testament. This, This word here translated in most of our Bibles as soul often just describes life, breath, a person, or a man in his entirety. In some places, it might might refer to the inner man, but that's not its predominant usage. So it's best just to understand this more along the lines of, you will not forsake my life to Sheol, or as the Christian Standard Bible captures it, you will not leave me in Sheol. It's his person that he's concerned about. Well, the other word that needs to find is Sheol. Sheol does not refer to hell. Um, Old Testament scholars such as Walter Kaiser have argued that the exclusive meaning of Sheol in the Old Testament is the grave. Granting that to be true, what David is saying is that he knows he can live his mortal life with complete confidence and trust in the Lord, even if that means his own death, because He knows that God will not abandon him in the grave. David's flesh can dwell in hope because he knows God's death will not be his final resting place. His own death, sorry. And what, what is this? This is actually an expression of David's hope in a resurrection. And while some have sought to deny that Old Testament believers had any understanding of a bodily resurrection at all, this isn't true. The hope of the resurrection and the believer's ultimate victory over death, although not as prominent as the New Testament, can be found in your Old Testament. We won't turn them, but you can write down Job 19, Daniel 12, Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 37, and then Psalms 17, 24, 49, and 73. Um, this is just a, a fascinating study. And here in Psalm 16, 10, David expresses his hope that he will not remain in the grave. And in verse 10b, David speaks to the basis of that hope that makes his heart glad. And up to 10b, David has been speaking in the first person. I take refuge in you. You are my Lord. I have no good. My delight. I shall not pour. I will not take their names upon my lips. My inheritance, my cup, my lot. I will bless Yahweh, my mind, my flesh, my soul. But then notice the shift of the third person title in verse 10b. You will not give your Holy One over to see corruption. He doesn't say me. 
But then notice again, immediately afterwards in verse 11, the focus again is on what God will make known to me. God will make known to me the path of life. So why this change in 10b? Who is this holy one that David says, God will not give over to see corruption of the grave? Of course, we know that David's body would in fact experience the corruption of the grave. And this is precisely the point that both Peter and Paul make in Acts when they quote this passage. But God's holy one or his faithful one must be identified as someone other than David. And especially given the messianic title, that holy one that David uses, but we won't go down that rabbit trail as fun as it would be. And that holy one would not experience the corruption of the grave. His body would not decay. And of course, that is different than saying he won't die. It doesn't say the holy one won't die, but he won't experience corruption. That holy one, of course, is none other than the heir that was promised to David, who would reign on David's throne, have an eternal kingdom, when Israel's enemies would no longer trouble them. And so what David sees here is actually the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who, though he would experience physical death, would be raised again to life on the third day without ever experiencing the decay and corruption of the grave. And Acts 2, 30, 30 through 31, just drives this home. Listen to it as I read it. And here we have inspired commentary on what David knowingly spoke about in Psalm 16. And so because he was a prophet, that is David, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of the fruit of his body on his throne, that is Davidic covenant. Because of that, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither forsaken to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. While it can be said that David was not abandoned in the grave, even though he has been left there for a very long time and his flesh is still there today, it can't be said, however, that his body did not experience decay and corruption. But both of those things can be said of Jesus Christ. And David, knowing what had been promised to him in the Davidic covenant, saw this reality of Christ's resurrection as a prophet when he penned Psalm 16. So David can be joyful even in the face of death because he knows death will not have ultimate victory over him. Death cannot take away Yahweh as his portion. Death cannot take away Yahweh as his inheritance. So death is powerless to take away his joy. But even more than that, death would prove powerless over David's descendant, who in the words of Peter a millennia later would put an end to the agony of death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. David knew the powerlessness of death to rob him of his joy, its powerlessness to rob him of Yahweh, and its powerlessness to, rob, to break God's covenant with him. If Jesus Christ would have remained in the grave, then the Davidic promise, which demanded an eternal reign of his singular descendant, would have been broken. But David's confidence in God's faithfulness to keep his word bolstered his confidence in the powerlessness of death. And we, this side of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have all the more reason to be confident of the powerlessness of death over Jesus Christ. But David has one more reason for his heart to be glad and his glory to rejoice. And this leads to the last essential stronghold of lasting joy in a world broken under sin. Number eight, anchor your hope in the certainty of full and eternal joy. In verse 11, David completes his own expression of hope to not be left forever in the grave. He says in verse 11, you will make known to me the path of life. Here David speaks to future realities. He speaks of a time after his own death that God will make known to him the path of life. 
and this is nothing short of his own resurrection, David has every confidence that because the Holy One, the Messiah would not remain in the grave, neither would he. David's soul is in the very presence of God, but his flesh is still waiting in hope of that resurrection. But notice what else he describes, this future path of life that God will make known to him, what it will include. Verse 11b, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. In the resurrection, we will be in the very presence of God himself. And this means joy in its fullest possible measure. Being in the presence of God in eternity and the actual physical presence of God's Holy One, Jesus Christ, will usher us into the greatest joy that we can ever know. How else does David describe that which accompanies the physical presence of God? Eternal pleasures, pleasures forever. In life and death, David knew that something better awaited him in eternity. A resurrected body, the very presence of God himself, the filling up of all joy and pleasures forever. In John 15, verse 10, Jesus said to his disciples, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my life. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. God doesn't ask him to follow him into a joyless life or for a boring eternity. Far from it, God offers joy in its fullest measure, joy without end to those who would follow after him. God is the giver of all good things. In David's word, we have no good without him. The good news of the gospel is that he has given us himself as our inheritance. Through the death of his son, Jesus, on the cross, he, he tasted death as a man on our behalf to satisfy God's wrath against our sin. But death could not hold him in its power. He was victorious over death. He rose from the grave. And when we die, we who have entrusted ourselves to Jesus Christ as Lord, as our, as our refuge, will be immediately ushered into God's presence to await the resurrection of our earthly bodies where he will finally fit us to experience forever the fullness of joy and eternal pleasures by his side that we were originally created to enjoy before we sinned against him. So our theology of the resurrection of Christ, our own resurrection, and our future joy is actually a catalyst, as it was for David, for our joy in this life now. We set our minds on these things. We long for them. We're motivated by them. We're able to fight for joy in this life because we know that joy awaits us in the next life. These eight refuges, these eight strongholds of lasting joy in a fallen world take refuge in God as a source of joy, acknowledge God's goodness as the foundation of joy, embrace God's people as the God's gift of joy, recognize the peril of counterfeit joy, Rejoice in God's provision of himself for our joy. Cling to God's wisdom as the ballast of joy and be convinced of the powerlessness of death and anchor your hope to the certainty of full and eternal joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we don't know what the fullness of joy and eternal pleasures is like, but you've promised it to us. Those who are in Christ know what awaits us. And we can be certain that your word is true. Just as you would not break your promise to David, you will not break your promise to us to bring us, usher us into your presence. Lord, this world is fallen. It's broken. We, there's sin. There's evil. There's sin even in us. 
And yet we have every confidence, every reason to fight for joy now. Lord, the disciples were equipped to have a joy that could not be taken away even when the world turned against them and put them to death. And Lord, we have that same thing. Lord, help us to take hold of it. Help us to fight for it, to cling for the joy which you have accomplished for us and given to us through your son. In your name we pray, amen.